company, Access Dental Services, uh, especially for us being in Southwest Missouri. It is not a place that we've easily been able to recruit, but over the last three years, we have found a total of four doctors that we have coming on board. We're interviewing four more right now, and I believe two of them are actually coming out to Missouri in May. So that's not bad for eight doctors in, in three years when I think it took us usually about 18 months, almost two years. The last open position we had, it took us almost two years to fill before Dennis job committed. So. And I'm, uh, I'm Brandon Labe. I'm uh, one of Arash's new associates. Um, Dennis Job Connect was great for me uh, with finding different opportunities. It's uh, very well laid out and it kind of tells you all the different benefits of each job opportunity. And it's uh, very easy to use. You kind of can search by like location and everything. And it just made it very simple and easy to find different opportunities that suited my needs best. And um, I'm very lucky to have found Aras. Welcome to From Invisible to Irresistible Secrets to Boosting Your Dental Practices Market Appeal and Value. I am so excited for this webinar, and we're going to welcome our guest up to the stage in just a second. If you would like a copy of this recording to share with anyone, watch instead of your favorite streaming channel, just text DSO to 215-798-9897. Text DSO to 215-798-9897. And if you would like help hiring an associate through Dennis Job Connect, like you've heard from Dr. Ross, just text HIRE to 215-798-9897. And every good webinar starts on time. So we're on time to welcome Dr. Tarek, uh, Angela Baker, Sheena Hinson. You can un you can start your videos so we can all see each other. We'll see each other big here in just a second. So excited to have you guys on our panel today. We're going to share so much value about how to get ready for one of the biggest decisions of your dental career. You guys are welcome to share your, share your videos whenever you are ready. Uh, I see here Angela coming on. And my rest of my team is ready unless I have to do something. To Mine the won't allow me to oh, start my special, video. Special, special, uh, Sheena, I always oh, want to see. There we go. Yeah, there's Sheena there. and Dr. Tarek. I'm ready for you. So we are here to share amazing value, help you in making decisions with more success and less stress. We're talking about dreams. So I just like to share my failed dreams. My dream was to play professional basketball in the NBA. That dream failed. You go to this size, you have this speed, you got to get new dreams. So this is my backup dream, but I appreciate Dr. D'Angelo Webster sending me a Dr. Nacho basketball. I'll grab a photo of this guys and put it out there for him. So, so thrilled to have you guys on here. I just would like to take a few minutes for you to orient the audience as to who you are and what you do to help dentists increase success, decrease stress, and most of all, reduce the number of times they feel like crying inside a day. I will start with uh, my friend and the awesome Sheena. Tell us what you do out here in the space. Yes. So I do strategic initiatives with Clue Dental Marketing. Awesome. And I'm here. I know you asked earlier. I'm in the beautiful state of South Carolina. Nice, you know, everyone. I'm in Philadelphia, the birthplace of our nation. Please come to a nacho event. It's your patriotic duty to show up here, eat our amazing food, uh, see George Washington tents that's here, and hang out. Uh, Angela, I'll go to you next. Hi, I am a uh, business banker. I have been working with dentists on the uh, finance side for uh, 22 years, and I help them um, grow, buy practices, help them with everything as far as banking is concerned, and more, which you'll find out here uh, throughout the webinar and I'm in the Chicagoland area, but I work nationwide. Thanks. Awesome. Jay. And I always share when I talk about this, that um, many people tell dentists like Dr. Tarek and I, that they hate us. They open their conversations with that. I don't know why they go, they say, I just want to let you know, I hate the dentist. And I say, I just want to let you know, you could have kept that in your head, but banks like us, banks are like our mom. So thank you for existing, right? You know, you believe in us, you give us money when we have debt. So banks like us and uh, Dr. Tarek, please uh, share what you do. Well, first of all, uh, you rocked your alternate dream. So awesome. <laughs> thanks, thanks, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so my name is Tariq Ali. I used to be a periodontist in a previous life. And what was I thinking? I really didn't want to be a dentist, but I went to therapy and recovered and started building <laughs> and buying dental practices um, uh, since uh, 20, uh, 
2009 started building and buying dental practices. And now with the three DSOs, I co-own 92 dental offices. 92, that is, that is impressive and amazing. I kind of say that um, owning a dental practice is like running a circus where the animals don't try to eat you, just slowly annoy you to death, question yeah. your sanity, and make you want to move into the middle of the woods and do dentistry on squirrels. Why does the giraffe always get off on July 4th? I always should go off on July 4th, but I really, that is amazing. And just having someone on here who is attached to 92 dental practices is just fantastic. So we're going to go through some Q&A. We have people watching in on Zoom. Please feel free to ask questions. We have people watching on Facebook Live. And if you're watching near recording, please shout your questions at the TV. We'll hear you know, just kidding. You can email us at salsadentalnachos.com if you're watching or listening to this recording and you need more help. So the first question I would like to get started from Dr. Tarek is, why are you seeking a partner? There are dentists out there that may be doing it on their own, and it can be so stressful to do it on your own, and they're exploring partnership. So tell us, you know, why would someone be seeking a partner? To you, what does that mean? Well, so that's a great question, Paul. When I started to re to understand what is the definition and meaning of success, because in the Western world, if you ask someone, uh, what does it mean to be successful? Or if you say this person is successful, what do they think of? They always think about financial success, right? They always think about, oh, they have means, they have resources. But it's 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 really not just that. It's a uh, it's six factors. It's family life. It's love life. It's health and fitness. It's uh, uh, reasonable financial prosperity. It's spiritual life. It's multi factors. So we tend to just focus on one aspect and ne neglect the other. And we realize that it is, it, it has to be harmonious and homogenous. So I started my soul searching and like, you know, what I'm, why am I doing this? I'm 24 seven at work. I'm 24 seven with patients. I'm 24 seven uh, fighting fires. I would rather have a smaller piece of the pie and have a much bigger pie then I'd rather, instead of having 100% of one location, I'm okay having five or 10% of 100 or 10. And at yeah. the end of the day, there is some, there's someone there with me minimizing risk, mitigating risk. There's someone helping me with it. And each one is doing their superpowers. You have a superpower right. and I have a different superpower. Together, we can make this pie grow bigger and I would have less stress. So I'll have a whole- I love that. Stress. I mean, I'm going to use that as the first aha moment or golden nugget of- sharing a smaller piece of a bigger pie. And what I can add, I only have two practice locations, four practice total, but it's the same feel. You also get to share in the stress as well with other people who can do what you do. And I think that's a really important point. So I, I love that answer and what you're seeking in a partner. Now, let's say we're just running down this journey or walking down and you say, okay, how do I make my practice more attractive to a potential partner. Sheena, tell us a little bit about that. So you got to practice, right? And the practice is more than just your building. And you can tell us about that. But how do you make a practice more attractive to a potential partner? Well, I think if we go with, you know, imagine if you're newly single and you're, you're getting on a dating app, right? Where is the first place that people are seeing you? It's online. So, you know, same thing, whenever people are looking at the M&A side of things, they're not just going to, going to go on a tour of dental yeah. practices, they're going to look online. So that's where I would start making sure, just like, again, if it was a dating profile, we want to look polished. We don't want to, you know, miss the details. We certainly don't want to misrepresent, right? I love um, that. You know, making sure that the, the optics are correct. You know, if your practice is very like branded from a personal standpoint, if it's, you know, Dr. Paul Goodman, DDS, and that's the name of your practice, but you're wanting, you know, to, to sell it, then you definitely need to consider investing in a rebrand, you know, and need to look at your, your numbers. What is, what are the KPIs telling us that are going to impact that valuation as far as new patient flow, things like that. And then you can measure you know, how's marketing looking is, I, you know, I love this. You know, we, we recently just interjected. We recently added uh, some new team members, both Dennis job, job, and dental nachos. And everyone sits down and says, I checked you out online. And does your website reflect your awesomeness, whether you're looking <laughs> to hire an associate, what I'll say, you know, Dr. Tarek and I are the only ones crazy enough to become dentists, but why do dentists have the most up-to-date technology for Sarex? They do guided surgery, 
but their website looks like when the internet was invented, okay? And that is a Sebastian Maniscalco joke. I want to give him credit. I don't want to steal. But why, I mean, Sheena, you see this regularly. And is it um, not knowing? Is it weird dentist cheapness? Is it like, you know, if your website does not reflect your awesomeness, it doesn't get started right. Tell us about that. I don't think that it's weird dentist cheapness. I'll say that. Um, but I do think that a lot of times it's really a misunderstanding, if you will, of what is an expense versus an investment. You know, whenever there are cash yeah. flow problems and we're like, oh, we we don't have a new patient, enough new patients, we've got to cut something. And then in many cases, oh, that marketing budget is is the first thing that's cut. When in reality, if it is a solid, measurable, impactful marketing campaign, that's something that that's an investment, not an expense. So I love that. that's hold that's off on Dr. Harrison. Hold off on the toy. Hold off on the toy that you want to buy that you think is going to bring it. No one's ever once knocked on my door and said, Hey, can I see your CBCT? I'm zero <laughs> times as anyone. And while that's a valuable thing, you're sharing such immense value. You also said it's like going on a dating website. So our practices have to cut out carbs, stop eating carbs immediately when you get out there. So I they're love delicious. That. They look great on Instagram, <laughs> yes. but do they yes. really help us get closer to our goal? Right. Yes. <laughs> and I, they don't always. Uh, now I want to talk, move to Angela because every dentist in the history of time, I believe thinks their practice is worth more than it's actually worth, right? I sold practices. I help with transitions. I own practices. I am sure I am guilty of this in my own practices. It's like thinking of the attractiveness level of your children or how well behaved they are. So give us some insight on practice valuation because we talked about why you'd want a partner. Okay. Why you want a partner? How do you make it more attractive? And now as you dig into the practice valuation piece of us piece of this give us some insight on that Even sure, well, I, like one say, practice evaluation. I like how you say that you know it's like kind of emotional because we always say like <laughs> so a lot of times uh you know the practitioner or the owner thinks that the practice is worth a little bit more than it actually is worth and it's only because of the blood sweat and tears that is put into yes. it so it's like no disrespect but it's like so emotional they're just hanging on because they built this thing over time and so it's really hard for them to let go and so a lot of times, like our our customers will come to us and say, you know, what is our what is my practice worth? And so obviously that's a little bit of a sliding scale, right? Um, but typically, when you look at a valuation, you look at like what the EBITDA or what the practice is like earning, or the you know basically the net income. And so if you could get to your earning and you adjust it to have your interest expense, your depreciation. Uh, amortization, it basically gives you, you know, what the practice, how the practice, what the dollar amount is and what's the profit of the practice. And so if you have a solo practice, typically, you know, they have these uh, multiples, let's say, and for one practice, it's like three to three and a half times. And obviously there's other factors that go into that. But if you have a million dollar practice, you know, maybe it's worth it's earning 300,000, maybe it's worth 900,000, you know, 300,000 times three, let's just keep it really simple. Um, but there's other factors that go into it. Like, what does your hygiene uh, look like? You know, the more hygiene you have, you know, which could be anywhere from 20 to 30% of the production will increase the valuation. Um, what does your collection rate look like? Um, you know, like, you know, you know, there's this new term within dentistry that I think has been in the medical field for a while is like revenue cycle management, right? Yeah. So you want to analyze, you know, what the revenue looks like. And so not to dig in too much, but, you know, needless to say, like, this is what your banker can do for you. So if you're, if you go to your banker and lay out and look at your financials, and another thing is like, you need to know your business. So your financials should be consistent. You should have them on a quarterly basis. You should be able to read them. You should be able to see trends and your banker and your advisors can help you with that. I love that. You set me up. So Dr. Craig, you said there are many things to think about, but I only think about two things in my life. And I put them on this t-shirt, yeah. biceps and EBITDA. So I'm just going to do bicep curls and work on my EBITDA. This entire presentation <laughs> made this for Dr. Mark Costas. Now, as you know, so my, you made some really good points, all of you. I just want to dig in more to you. So when my five-year-old says I have money, she comes with this purse, there's coins falling out of it. There's dollar bills. No one can tell how much money she has. And it's not that much, but I believe dentists, at times, and I could have been, are guilty of doing like sharing like, hey, their, their financials are not in order. They're disorganized, right? So we talk, Dr. Eric, you know, why you might want to need a partner. Sheena has told us about how to start to make your practice more attractive. 
But talk to us about getting the financials in order. If someone's listening or watching saying, I do $1.5 million a year, feels like I make 500 grand. I don't even know what EBITDA is. Should they go to a bookkeeper? Should they go right to the bank? Should they talk to their accountant, all three? What would be your best advice? So my my first advice would be to get with like a dental CPA or a CPA that's familiar with, with the dental business or any type of like uh, medical healthcare practice and uh, talk with them about like what your goals are. Um, also, I would recommend uh, talking with your financial advisor so that way they can tell you like when you can retire so then you know like when that's going to happen. But back to getting to organize so you can let them know that um, you know, you want to know either on a quarterly or monthly basis, sort of what, you know, what the revenue is, what the earnings are and have them walk you through the income statement and what exactly everything means. Because when you do go sell your practice, I mean, on the profit and loss, there are some discretionary expenses that you've been spending that um, can be added back as part of the profit. So have them walk you through what the whole P&L looks like so you can understand sort of where your expenses are. And a lot of times they'll put the percentage of the revenue on the um, expense line. So like marketing, let's say, you know, is at 4%, maybe you need to increase your marketing to yeah. normalize it to like 6% and so on and up and so down. It's like, I mean, using Tarek, Dr. Tarek, it's like, it's like a good body analysis of your practice. Take this time <laughs> out, look at the pain, see where you're, you might be stronger in certain areas than you think. And I want to say, Dr. Tarek, you've been a dentist and, you know, I have too. It's easy to lose sight of this, even for great dentists, right? And it doesn't mean you're a terrible business person. It just is so exhausting to go in and do dentistry, manage the team, that it's easy to lose sight of this. I'll let you and Sheena kind of both answer this. Has this ever happened to you in your journey where you've lost sight of your numbers? Has it happened to people that you talk to? And, and what would you advise a dentist if they're going through this? Absolutely. So um, think about it this way. How can you drive a car without looking at your gauges? How could you fly a plane? I'm a pilot and I fly planes. Would you fly with me if I'm not looking at my gauges? I don't know how fast I'm going. I don't know if we're gonna stall or what. Why do we treat our businesses and our dental offices the same? We stop tracking our KPIs and our numbers. And it's because your eyes and brains get adapted to the status quo. How, how many times have you walked into your uh, teenager uh, kids room and see how messy it is and wonder what in the world can they not see the mess it doesn't yeah. make any sense their eyes and brains have adapted to the messiness same thing we just like it's like we you just float you just cruise and that's when specialization makes a big difference that's when partnership that's when giving the specialty to 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 everyone has a superpower Right. You can't do it all. You think you can do it all, but you can't. So, yes, I, I want to share with you, you. Your analogy is great. And you know what? I just finished hijack with Idris Elba, a true, true international treasure of an actor. And you know what I actually thought of? I never thought for there's no co-pilot. You're the only pilot. You don't have a clone. Right. So what happens is, you know, when you don't have a another version of yourself to look at it, you get so engrossed in doing the dentistry. And now I'll kind of say to you, Sheena, you do this like the team aspect of it. How does that distract maybe the dentist from being able to pay attention to the most fundamental factors with their numbers? I think a lot of time, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of frustration in, in many cases with the human capital. That's right. a hard um, investment to grow, right? It's a lot more tricky than, you know, the numbers are pretty black and white. So making sure that you're, you know, of course, marketing, but from a team standpoint, investing and training them to a high level so we can take a right. little bit of that chaos out of the day. But from a marketing standpoint, when we're talking about measuring, know what you're looking at. And, you know, as um, Tarek said, if you aren't an expert in that, find the right expert. You know, you, right. you don't have to learn it all and know it all. Like with marketing, we hear all the time, well, you know, we're getting this many impressions. Well, impressions are meaningless. How many I also want to share, you, you know, and I, I keep going, like, what's wild to me is that a dentist will be so responsible about referring someone for impacted wisdom teeth. A dentist will be so responsible about referring someone for a second molar endo, but they go, I'm going to learn Google ads myself. I go, what, what time? Even when you learn, you still stink at it. They've been playing golf for 20 years. They're worse than when they started. So uh -huh. what I want to share is it's wild to me that the same brain that goes, I don't do impacted wisdom teeth. I wouldn't try it. Then goes home and Googles how to do my own Google ads to save $500. <laughs> and I believe that that 
trait or that trend has to be changed if you want to partner with the right people, if you want to grow, because the DIY tendency can, I think, cause disaster. I don't know what you think, Sheena. I totally agree. And I think that it's not just because someone else, maybe you can do it to a high standard, but do you really want to be the chief everything officer? Hey. And, and in dentistry, we talk about, oh, I want to work on my practice, not in my practice. But we don't really want to relinquish any of those responsibilities, right? We want to make sure that it's done. But, you know, the most successful practices, and I'm sure that that both of you doctors would agree, are the ones who have the team that they are trained to a high level. There's accountability in place. And they let them take what they're great at and own it and do it. And then the doctor can do the things that only they can do, yes. right? You know, who not how? Figure that out master what you're great at stay in your zone of genius and you'll probably save a couple of headaches down the road too i i love that i mean one of the things i'll share is whenever i do these things with these awesome people the dr mark costas of the world link say what do you wish you did sooner what do you wish you did sooner i could say this to you dr Tarek, as a dentist and usually it's i wish i got coaching sooner i wish i started delegating stuff sooner i wish i knew i could ask for help sooner so when you see these themes from people who have achieved so much that's awesome so back to a little bit of our story of this getting your practice ready to either grow, partner with a DSO. Let I like this concept of practice staging. I'd like a minute from each of you. You know, when should you initiate the practice staging process? What is that? And I'll start with you, Dr. Tara. Kind of tell our audience, I love this concept. It's actually the first time I've thought of it this way. So, and I think it's brilliant. So each of you kind of give me a minute on that. Yes, so the short answer is yesterday because okay. you're not changing your practice or your, let's say the dating example you don't have to wait uh to get better you have to get better every day you don't have to wait to stage your practice your practice has to have systems and process and checklists your practice has to have good kpis your practice has to have good training uh, and, and, and manuals for your team. Your practice has to have great revenue and increasing with great, uh, with steady uh, improvements. Your practice has to have great revenue cycle management from every $100 that you produce, you have to collect at least 98% of that or $98 out of the, every 100. You have to have good procurement systems, HR, compliance, accounting, it's, it's just a fact of life. You can't wait until before you want to transition or sell or partner or stage it. you got to change today. I, I absolutely love that. It's the ability to answer questions with confidence. I coach new dentists on how to find a job. And one of the questions I ask them to ask is, you know, what's the traditional percentage that your PPOs write off your fees, right? Just ask when you're on the interview, like just so that you're not doing the, the worst crowns. And when they go, I don't know, we'll find that later. It's not an, a question with confidence. How do you manage revenue cycle management? We use this company. This is what we do. So I really like that. Uh, Angela, how about you with, I know it's not your, your forte, but you're involved in this whole world and everyone goes to you for the final answer, like that show, uh, who wants to be a millionaire? What's the amount of money I get? So you're the most important one with that. Uh, tell us about the practice staging process from your angle. So like Tarek mentioned, I mean, like yesterday, so you're always kind of working on it, but it takes time. So you need to give yourself time. So like we talked before, like looking at the financials and maybe you need to increase your revenue. Well, it doesn't really happen overnight. So, I mean, as a group, we've kind of talked like, you know, sometimes it's 18 to 24 months, depending on what you're looking to do. So it's, it's sort of subjective, but you should always be keeping up with, you know, your metrics and your checklists. And uh, before I go to Sheen, I want to share that I love you know, being this um, fake doctor, I made up Dr. Nacho, and I get to help with a lot of awesome things, but I actually get called on for a lot of awful things. And, you know, I've got called on from families whose dentists who've suddenly passed away, and they were not ready in any way, shape or form to sell their practice. And they left their family with a total nightmare on their hands, nightmare emotionally, a nightmare financially. So even if you're just listening as a practice owner, who's not ready to partner with anyone, Getting yourself ready to sell your practice the day you buy your practice is really important because life happens to you when you're making other treatment plans. And even though, as you mentioned, you want to get to crushing it, Bill, right, uh, Angela, where, where the, the streets are paved with 39% EBITDA, right? There's also crying it, Bill, where you can get to without factors out of your control. And the world, well, life is crazy. So I think I'm really glad you shared that because you do not want to leave your family and your team with a total mess in your hand. And I've been involved in a lot of messes over the past few years, which have just been uh, heartbreaking to deal with, honestly. 
Well, you know, like what Track was also saying how, you know, it's like always better in number. So like, that's why it is sometimes better to have a partner if you can make it work or multiple dentists. And even from the bank perspective, because God forbid something were to happen, the operation is still running even without that. Right. Unfortunately, that one person. So yeah, like, know, know we don't want call. riots though. We don't want any. Yeah, I mean, know who to, I've had, you know, an awesome life and some tragedy happened in my life. You know who to call to stabilize a disaster. And sometimes that's an associate dentist. Sometimes that's an accountant and give your team that. Back to the more positive aspect, Gina, of staging. I want to get your thoughts on this staging. Like people stage a home to sell. What does that staging process mean to you? And when should it be initiated? Well, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth with what you said. So 100% in agreement with that. And as they said, you should start yesterday. And even if you're like, you know what? I don't know if I want to transition. I don't know if I want to sell. You still need to have these systems in place because there are a lot of people who are doctors who want to sell their practice just because they don't have these systems in place. But then we want top dollar. But so why it's it's like whenever you do sell a home, you know, you wait until you put it on the market and you fix all those little annoyances <laughs> that drive you nuts, but you wait and do it for someone else. Yes. So go yeah. ahead and do that in your practice now, because it's going to definitely take the crying out of your day. It's going to make your team happier, which solves an entire host of everything else, you know, that you're dealing with that's making you go crazy. But then it's, you know, with a, from a valuation standpoint, you're not going to like trick the valuation. Like, oh, we've been getting five new patients a month. But, you know, right before I sell, I'm just going to crank up yes. the marketing. You know, the numbers tell that story. So, you know, you want to have a healthy growing practice now because, I mean, the reality of it is if your practice isn't growing, it's failing. Yeah, I, I believe that. I remember as an eight-year-old kid, I was in this kind of entrepreneurial spirit we were moving my parents like I had to scrape the old wallpaper off and I'm like why can't I be like playing Atari my mom's like we need to make it look nice for the new buyers I go what about us? us so it's a ta it's a tale as old as time it's a tale as old as 1988 where you're always trying to make things look as good as possible so now Tarek you brought some checklists I'm we'd love for you to share them if you want to give us some insight on them if you want to share your screen I thought those were great beforehand um, yeah so um it Regarding checklists, every if you know me, I love checklists and systems and processes. I have triplets at home, so I have a checklist. Oh, for wow. uh, but anyways, um, I wanted to share with you guys a pre-LOI practice evaluation checklist, which we use to buy before we buy or partner in any dental practice. Cool. Uh, let me see. share it while we're uh, you know, up here, because I think I have a great value. If you're listening and you want to watch this recording later, please just text DSO to 215 seven nine eight nine eight nine seven we're talking with the awesome Sheena Hinson of Clue Dental Marketing Dr. Tarek Ali is going to be sharing his uh, checklist system here and he is the owner of Orthodent uh, Modern Smiles DSO and part of CDP and Angela Baker Vice President of Winchester Trust Bank uh, she calls herself the top money giver outer to people at parties that's what she says she does I give money to dentists. So yeah, Tara, give us a few minutes of insight on this. I know my dentists love details. They want to know the pro. Yes. You got number 15 while they're working on 30. Why? They don't know. Dentists made the school made us weird. So give us some of these details. Yeah. So macro to micro, um, th this list, think of it this way. If we have this list, we can pretty much determine whether we're going to buy or partner with this particular dental office. Uh, you know, the, the normal stuff, okay, location, all that stuff, reason for transition, asking price, all that. But let's get into the nitty gritty. Well, we want to know how many years in operation because trend is your friend. We want to see the trend. Hey, is it going up? Is it going down? Is it plateauing? Uh, has it been associate driven? Has it been always the owner operator and run? Uh, does it is you have hygiene? How much do you rely on hygiene? How many functional wounds do you have versus that we can expand if you if, if there's ability to expand? Well, show me the revenue for three years and of course annualize the current year. What does revenue for three years mean? Again, trend is your friend. We want to know if it's climbing or is it declining and what are the reasons for any of those. Patient analysis, remember the, the office is worth what the you know patients basically, because equipment or assets in general don't don't mean much in the dental world. There are asset-based companies like a dealership, car dealership, or something, but in the dental world, it's usually the, the revenue coming from patients and goodwill that makes the the value. So patient trends uh, show us the number of new patients. Is it climbing? Is there declining? Um, show us the practice profile ratio. 
are you fee for service? Are you Medicaid or Dentical or PPO? What's what's your and that tells us the diversification of your revenue stream. Are you 100% Medicaid or are you 100% fee for service? Well, if that's the case, well, if something happened to the current dentist, that means our risk is high. So the beta factor or the risk is high, uh, which decreases the price or our affinity to actually partner with you. Marketing tools. Have you been doing, you know, believe it or not, offices that haven't done any marketing at all are more valuable to us. Uh, believe it or not, because that means there is that there's a big hole we can fix uh, that, that there's a huge upside. Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean stop doing marketing, of course, do marketing and continue to grow. Uh, but I'm just telling you from a perspective of, hey, is there room to grow? Uh, now, if we see a huge marketing budget, um, that is not a very good indication. That means that's very little room to grow that you've consumed your best, but it could also be that you're spending it in the wrong marketing yeah. tools. Uh, anyways, production by category, what does that tell us? It tells us what procedure codes can we add to grow the practice? Or are you doing procedure codes that we cannot replicate? Because there are some yeah. dentists out there are doing some... Um, medical billing and other stuff that we may not be able to replicate right um let's say uh the schedule we'd like to look at the schedule hr list that's important some offices have had their team members forever 20 plus years i've bought at least two practices that the youngest team member was 18 years in the practice uh which was amazing for Maybe us Maybe Dr. Tarek, and we'll, we'll we'll have some sequels we have more time here but i want to actually ask you this question in the moment because yeah. i know it'll be valuable you purchase practices they join your group, your DSO. Tell us just a minute of, does the team usually stay? Do they not stay? If somebody's worried saying, I want to sell to DSO, but I don't know if Dorothy is, wants to come and do this. Just, I know you won't be able to solve this in 60 seconds, but just maybe just give us some insight on that. Cause I know that's something that every practice owner thinks about. Absolutely. It's a big, it's a big topic. The short version is yes, people do not like change. It's very common for people to freak out when they know change is coming. And to approach it in a very delicate and tactful manner will make a huge difference. Communication, communication, communication. The more you communicate with them, let them understand what does it mean to actually partner. Let them understand that, hey, there's really no changes happening. They're just, we're just gonna have more helping hands. Yeah. Imagine uh, in the billing world, you're gonna have someone doing your verification for you. If, they, if you want them to, if you don't, you can still keep it. So communication is key. If you do the right sequence with the proper communication, they tend to have anxiety, a little bit less anxiety, a lot more confidence. Awesome. Give us one more from your checklist you want to highlight, then we'll go back to our big screen. But this is great. I'm, I'm people I will be able to, uh, at the end, have people know they can reach out to you guys if people want to talk to you more about this checklist. But give us one. You, you stopped at HR list, but give us your top one from 14 to 22 for people to... Uh, one more core thing that we look at, we always match your P&Ls with your tax returns, with your PMS, the practice management software, with your bank accounts. Meaning that we want to make sure if you produced a million, that you actually, that it, you collected a million or close, it went into your bank, you filed the tax returns accordingly, and your accountant said that's what it is on the PLs. Once gotcha. these matches, we feel a lot more confident and comfortable in proceeding. I like that. Well, this is great sharing, and we'll uh, dig into this more in future ones where you can unshare. Awesome. So, we have kind of have a couple of final questions. This has been awesome. You guys have been sharing so much value. If people are here in the audience, they want to ask something, uh, we can have time for that. But I want to go to this specific one, you know, <clears throat> practitioners pivoting, they have to think different. Sheena, tell us a little bit about this. You've been in dental offices, you've worked in dental offices, being the chief everything officer, which I love this phrase you guys came up with, can be oddly comforting to a lot of dentists, right? It's like the grandmother who gets very upset at Thanksgiving dinner that she has so much to do, but won't let you bring the bread to the table because you don't know how to carry bread the way she knows how to carry bread, right? So being the chief everything officer comes with a lot of stress and a lot of comfort and you must make a shift, right? You, It's impossible to partner with a group, partner with every anyone in any capacity. Tell us a little bit, about the shift in this role? I think that it has to be, whether you're you're looking to, to sell or you're looking to stay for your own sanity. Um, I don't know why that is the mentality, not only in dentistry, but in many businesses. Because as entrepreneurs, you know, we tend to want perfection and nobody has the same vision of that perfection as we do. 
Um, and I see in dental practices, and I know, Paul, you and I have talked about this a good bit, is there's frustration. You know, my team, they they don't think like an owner. Or they don't they don't take ownership with this or that or they, they don't understand, you know. You know, you, the hygienists are like, oh, they just don't value me as, as an employee. And then the, the doctors and the owners are like, they just they just want to make money and they don't want to take ownership. But it's all miscommunication and yeah. training. And that is an investment. You know, I was talking about that earlier. That's an investment that you need to make for your own sanity so that you cry less. Right. That's yeah. our goal. Right. And so I think that is key. Um, but just make sure that you know what success looks like for you. Right. Again, this yeah. is if we're getting ready for acquisition or not. If you can't define that for yourself, how can anyone else? You know, I, I, and if I you don't that. know, lean on the experts. I mean, I'm just a huge Gary Vaynerchuk fan. And he talks about how, you know, he's had friends doing companies that do five million, they do 10 million, they were happy to miserable and vice versa. There's also this no alternative universe. I think, you know, dentists sadly are trained in such a weird way with their brain and dentistry that makes it really a, a liability in business because they want to know the answer before they take the test. And it's literally impossible. They want to know what food tastes like before they put it in their mouth. If you tell me it tastes good, I'll put it in my mouth. And I said, there's no universe that does that. You have to make the, the best choice for you. And that's why, Angela, I want to kind of go to you because we talked about practice valuation, but as we kind of bring this first webinar we do home, misconceptions about practice valuation. So when you run a giant Facebook group like Dental Nachos, you have a lot of people shouting out things that are just flat out wrong, right? DSOs pay 50 times EBITDA and they don't know what EBITDA is. You can get 70% for your practice no matter what and they have no idea. So just give us some misconceptions that you might have to recenter people's expectations when you talk to them at the bank about the value of one of the most important things they've ever done, right? One of the literally the most important things they've ever done, build a practice, grow a practice. What are some valuation misconceptions? Yeah. So, I mean, like we said before, it's emotional. They always think that they could kind of get more than it's worth. So you kind of have to walk them off the ledge and walk them through it. Um, but a lot of times we see like um, some of the younger dentists who, you know, think that they can retire um, and so there's a misconception because, you know, they're going to get like this large lump sum of money, which they think is large, and then they have to live the rest of their lives. And so it's like, well, you should work while you can. And like this business is always going to be consolidating. And so that's another misconception is like a lot of time it's the age like, well, I want to be able to, you know, coach my kids softball game or whatever. And it's like, well, you can do that. Um, and then I think like, uh, as far as like valuation, like culture, you know, can be yeah. a misconception too. Cause I mean, you can't really sell culture, right? So, I mean, if you have culture and you can build a good culture around you, maybe you don't have to be the chief operating officer of everything or chief everything officer. So uh, there's a lot of misconceptions, but it's just a matter of being educated. There's a lot of things just flying around in the industry, but um, you can't get 15 times. Yeah. Right. And, and it's a, it's, it's, I think it's very cool that information can be shared so quickly in 2023 through the power of social media, but it also comes at a risk because you know sometimes people call me and say, I did this thing. I go, why did you do that? That was stupid. They go, I saw it on dental notches. I go, you know, those people are just like you. They don't know anything either, right? Hire a professional that does stuff, right? I would say, if you want to complete a marathon, ask your friend if, who did a marathon. If running that marathon determines your financial future, please hire a marathon coach not bill your dental school roommate who finished a marathon. So one of the things I kind of want to wrap up with, I'll start with you, Dr. Tarek, is Dennis Job Connect worked really hard to solve what I think is one of the biggest problems in dentistry, bonding dentists together to work in the same place, under the same proverbial roof. And we are not, we don't play well together, right? Dental school doesn't teach us to play well together. So associates, Dr. Tarek, how have they helped you? If you're, whether it's the, practice looking to hire one, whether it's you giving advice to a newish dentist, you know, talk about the associate and how they help drive growth, sanity, how they've helped you build your business. Well, if you, it's like a train, the engine of the train is the associate. It's the provide. If you think about it, what is important for us in our career? The, the top three things uh, that are very, very important for us in our career. Number one, is the highest quality of patient care. So patient care is number one. Number two is our team members and their satisfaction, retention, and growth and development. Number three, it's EBITDA. Right. These are the top three. So if you want to say, hey, what are the top three? Patient care, team, and EBITDA. 
the associates are the biggest driver for all three of these. Yeah, that's an awesome way to put it. So um, if you, what are the associates to us are the, the continuation of care. Uh, they're doing exactly what you would do as a dentist to the patient. In fact, they should be doing better than you would as an extension of you. Two, they're not just a provider. They are leaders. We don't manage people. We manage process and lead people and lead by example. Yeah, you know how many associates you've heard of that would throw the instruments on the ground because they were throwing a fit or, yeah. or right? The, uh, it happens. So leadership, it's not anyone can fill a tooth, but not anyone can be a true leader. I, I love that. That's why lead, you know, it's, I always share, it's like you're leading inside of that operatory. Seinfeld always says you got to solve every problem in the shower yourself, right? You know, you can't call for help. So like it's you, the assistant and the patient. So when these associates say, I don't want to be an owner, I say, okay, fine. Maybe not being an owner is your path. That could be an amazing path. You still have to be a leader because you have you and the dental assistant. Um, Sheena, tell us a little bit about associates from your angle, whether people are a newish dentist looking to get a job or maybe a practice owner thinking of hiring their first one. Uh, tell us a little bit about your thoughts. I think, you know, first thing when you're thinking, okay, do I, is it time to bring in an associate? You need to make sure that, that obviously the schedule is ready for that. Your new patient flow is ready for that. Whatever I'm doing right now with marketing, as Tarek said, they're going to look at that marketing line item and they're going to say, is this ridiculous or not? So make sure what you're doing makes sense and isn't like hurting your value more than helping. And, and we can help you look at that and kind of measure what that, um, if it's working well and or if it's not. But I would say that and having those systems processes in place, right? That way, when that associate comes in, we've got the communication, how we're going to do the, the handoff. But making sure that, you know, once that associate comes in, how are we handling the, the patient flow? What are our processes around that? Is everybody on our team, do they understand like, okay, who's doing the exams? Who's seeing new patients? Who's getting the recares? So I think clarity around all of that is vital. That's where I see a lot of the pain points when I do go into practices. It, it really boils down to one thing and that's communication. I love that because, you know, many, many times I think practice owners have the misconception that hiring associate an associate relieves them of responsibility. But, you know, Dr. Tarek, it's just a shift in responsibility. It's a total shift. Yes, maybe you fill fewer class twos, but now you have this whole new plate of responsibilities that you need to master for you to grow. Because if you are the only person doing dentistry in your practice, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean you can't do that. It just means it's vulnerable to so many factors outside of your operatory. Angela, in the banking world, how do associates, I know you're not in these practices, uh, but anything on the associate side, whether it's on tax returns, P&Ls, any comments on associates? I mean, I think in general that as the dentist, you know, bringing an associate in, they have to be patient with the process because like you, you mentioned, you're very like-minded. And so sometimes it takes more than one associate to like work within the practice. You don't always get it on the first shot. And, you know, you have to make sure you have the capacity to bring the associate in. And then, um, you know, just know that the associate's going to want some ownership one day. Um, you're not going to be able to keep them forever. And so if you structure it the right way, I mean, it's kind of going to be a win-win for everybody. Yeah. And that's why I love doing this because more dentists working together. And that's why, even though it might be uncomfortable for many dentists listening to here, DSOs create the opportunity for more dentists to work together. Uh, you know, I'm friends with the Rodeo Dental Founders and I'm going to go to their dental day and they're hosting a big thing to, you know, celebrate associates. And there's, you know, dentistry is a lonely profession. So this isn't about DSOs versus private practice. It's just saying groups, DSOs do create this opportunity for people to work together. And, I, you know, dentistry, as you know, Dr. Chair, can be a lonely profession, even when you're surrounded by people. So really appreciate you guys sharing. You guys have delivered amazing value. I always want my audience to be able to connect with you guys directly. Dr. Tarek, if someone just popped on now and said, I want to hear about Dr. Tarek when he buys his 93rd practice, how can they reach out to you? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, yeah no problem. absolutely. Uh, anyone is welcome to reach out. Uh, I'll put my contact information here in the chat for anyone that wants to reach out. Feel free to. Awesome. I really appreciate that. Uh, Sheena, uh, how about you? Yes, I'm going to put my email in the chat as well at Sheena.Henson at Clue Dental Marketing. And so what we can do is share any of the, I know um, Tarek's going to put his checklist and stuff in there. And then if you want information on like what you're doing now from a 
metrics, like a measurable standpoint, we can help you with that regardless if you use Clue services or not. We just want to make sure that you're getting the highest return on whatever you're doing. So we'd be that. happy if you want to shoot us an email and just mention the webinar. Awesome. Thanks, Sheena. And Angela, how can people reach out to you if they need money and you have money? Same. I'll go ahead and put my information and I'd be happy to help and eat in like the non invasive way, you know, uh, just a general conversation um, to as much as like, you know, going over their financials with them if they want. So I'll share in this moment, you guys are right. And you can reach out to DennisJobConnect.com, me info at DennisJobConnect.com if you need any access to information here. But I want to just take a minute and I love meeting you guys. Relationships are so important in life. And I want to share, every dentist gets annoyed by this patient, Dr. Tarek. It's December 21st. Can I get in for my five crowns before the end of the year? I'm one of your best patients, right? I'm one of your best patients. And that patient either ignored your tax, didn't schedule, and it's not a comfortable relationship. Well, bankers and heads of DSOs and marketing people, they're people too. So I encourage my audience not to be that person. Don't say to the bank, I need you right now this minute because they have other customers and clients too. And just like our patients, you know, I always think it's funny when someone goes, I haven't been in since the pandemic. I go, that was 2015, sir. The pandemic was 2020. So it's just an opportunity to remind you that creating relationships unlocks the true magic in your life. So reach out to people so they know you before you may need them. So I truly appreciate all of you guys' um, insight. We're going to go off Facebook live stream here. We'll still be on Zoom, but thanks so much for sharing. All three of you are truly awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much.